Geeks and geekettes. Gats and gittens. It's Wednesday morning. It's time for another Ask Chuck Dixon. Sorry I wasn't here last week. But uh, I was stuffed with turkey and I couldn't move, let alone talk or make sense. Anyway, <laughs> that's half true. Um, let's get to your first question about what I do for a living. And what I do for a living is I write comic books. Samwise, nine. I found the Nightfall and No Man's Land crossovers to be similar in the way that they both have very strong beginnings and endings, but meander a little bit in the middle. Is there something in the nature of a big crossover events that causes this? I think it's in the nature of storytelling, that in the middle of the story, you it's, it's what every writer dreads. Um, that middle passage, that getting from the really cool introduction of a concept to its resolution. Uh, to the big climax scene, to the scene with all the explosions. It's the horse latitudes of writing. Uh, you, you, your, your imagination <laughs> is becalmed because you've got to fill this, this middle part of the story with something as interesting as the, the beginning. And hopefully they'll keep on reading to the end. I mean, that's the job of a writer to keep you reading. And you can't, unless you're writing a samurai story, simply uh, skip the middle part. I, I argue that sam most samurai movies have only two acts. Uh, the samurai gets pissed off. The samurai kills everybody. Uh, that's kind of the classic form. There's really no middle part uh, where he wonders about life or, or meets a new love. Um, but, you know, it's one of the difficulties of writing. It's one of the challenges of writing to keep things interesting. An example I often use is uh, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. Good, The Bad, and The Ugly has, has three killer openings as we introduce each of the three main characters, The Good, The Bad, The Ugly, um, uh, Clint Eastwood, Lee Van Cleef, and Eli Wallach. And we know from um, pretty much the first 20 minutes of the film that everybody's looking for this gold cache, this, 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 this uh, buried gold. Uh, hidden by someone <clears throat> in the uh, Confederate Army. And um, each of the three characters know part of the resolution. Each of the three characters know something about the location of the gold, uh, but none of them all know the same thing, so they can't find it. So uh, Sergio Leone and his writers fill the middle passage, the usually boring or slower part of a story, with these terrific series of betrayals and temporary alliances and complications. And the whole time you're forgetting about the gold. You're, you're, you get more involved in these three characters and their, their turbulent inner relations than you do in thinking about their quest. And quest stories are tough because all you're thinking about is the quest. Think Lord of the Rings. Um, and that was the brilliant thing about Lord of the Rings as well. Um, instead of, Tolkien was a genius, instead of having his characters go to find something, uh, <laughs> he has their characters going to throw something away. So we already know what the something is, but we don't know what, how are they going to destroy this thing? Um, you know, and, and again, Tolkien fills his story with, with betrayals and, you know, Gollum plays a large part in creating complications in the story you know, chases, fights, everything else. So you've got to you got to make sure when you're writing that it's all um, equally interesting and equally engaging. And uh, I agree. In a, in an event as long as No Man's Land, an event as long as Nightfall, I and mean, you have disparate writers, disparate uh, creative teams, you're going to run into a a few slow spots here and there in the story. It's got to happen because the story's long. Um, I mean, I would argue that even the Iliad and the Odyssey, you know, classics of Western literature have their, uh, their dry passages. So you get to the cool stuff at the end. So, hey, it's a Samwise Nine Twin Spin. He doesn't seem very excited about it, though. Okay, ironically, the character Anarchy is conspicuously absent from Batman No Man's Land. I wonder if this is due to Alan Grant being taken off Shadow of the Bat title just before the crossover began. I think this was a bit of a missed opportunity. What do you think he would have done with the character in that setting had he still been writing the book? Um, yeah, I think the simple 
I think you've you've got it. I mean, um, Alan was was taken off of the core Batman books along with Doug Mensch and I, all at the same time. We were all fired on the same day. Uh, <laughs> it was because of low sales. Sales were starting to dip, and DC thought it was time for a change. Uh, although none of the changes really worked. So, um, yeah, Anarchy wasn't included in No Man's Land because Anarchy is a character so associated with Alan Grant that I don't think anybody else wanted to touch it. Uh, he's a character created by Grant, uh, and he was very close to, to Alan's worldview. <laughs> uh, Alan was a... Uh, you never knew where Alan was going to fall at any given time on any given subject. You, you could never second-guess... I think Alan would say this. No, no one would ever say that if that knew Alan. So he had his he had his own way of thinking, um, a, a truly uh, individual mindset, and anarchy is the result of that. So so no one was going to touch it in no man's land. Uh, had Alan um, been a part of no man's land, yeah, I think anarchy would have been there absolutely, and he would have been a disruptor in the events, as he always was in his stories. Hokum, I know you're a huge fan of Westerns, and I'm curious if you have an opinion on the two that Tarantino made. They may not technically be Westerns, but Django Unchained and The Hateful Eight are in that theme. I was just wondering if you have any thoughts on them. Uh, well, they are Westerns. I don't, I've heard this said before, that these aren't Westerns. No, they are. They very much are, uh, both of them. And uh, Tarantino's a, a big Western fan. And I mean, he's a Western fan like I'm a Western fan. He loves them all. He loves the, you know, the singing cowboy Roy Rogers types Westerns. And he likes, um, you know, the, the spaghetti Westerns. He likes every kind of Western you can imagine, TV Westerns. And uh, he and I could probably share a long car ride just talking about Rawhide. Uh, so... <laughs> um, but Django Unchained is, is you know, a classic, you know, revenge Western. And, you know, Tarantino is such a Western freak that he didn't want to use any effects. He wanted to film these movies and film them all in film uh, as they might have filmed them in the, you know, 50s, 60s or 70s. That, that tremendous explosion sequence where all the horses fall and the men fall off of them. The vigilantes all get blown up. Uh, that was all real. Uh, he got real stuntmen, real cowboys, real horse wranglers, and they did those amazing shots uh, live in camera, uh, which no one does anymore. You know, and no horses were harmed because they trained the horses to fall. Uh, there are horses that just love their job of falling down. <laughs> so, um, you know, I like this movie. It's a, it's a mean, nasty Western revenge film, especially, oddly, we just talked about the middle passage of the story. I like the middle part of the story the most with, with um, Jamie Foxx and Chris Walls basically doing what they do. Uh, that amazing uh, sequence where they, uh, they're going to ambush these guys at a ranch, and it's, it's supposed to be Django's first kill as a uh, bounty hunter. And, um, but then we get to Hateful Eight, if you were to ask me, if you were to wake me up at four in the morning and say, what movie, don't even think about it, what movie do you wish you could unsee? And it would be Hateful Eight. A uh, huge disappointment for me. I mean, shot on 70 millimeter, awesome cast, Tarantino doing a Western again, big budget, and this movie is a freaking mess. Uh, it, this movie is all middle passage. 99% of this film is people sitting around waiting for something to happen. And uh, it's very, very sad. Uh, this movie should have had more action, <laughs> been moved around a little bit more, and uh, been shorter. And uh, I understand that a lot of the things that happen in this film are as a result of the screenplay being uh, hacked and put on the internet. And they made a lot of changes to the movie. And I think they were changes that didn't help it be an entertaining uh, film at all. Uh, and I think, you know, they put a lot of shock elements that were unnecessary and, and frankly quite unpleasant in the film. The, uh, and, you know, things that t to me felt very un-Tarantino, to be quite frank. And I don't understand why, because seriously, how many people read the screenplay on the internet? You know, and they were going to go see the movie anyway. How many people really spoiled this film for anybody? Uh, especially in these days. Maybe today with YouTubers uh, rushing to make videos that spoil films they've seen or films that events have been leaked. But 
you know, when Hateful Eight was in production, that really wasn't a big thing. And I think it was silly to alter the film. I, I, you know, I actually want to read the original screenplay now to see if it would have been a better film. Um, but the thing is that, that both of these movies are inspired by, um, you know, a lot of, um, you know, f- films that came before. I, and there's, a, there's a phrase I hate, and it's used all the time, anytime anybody makes a Western these days. Uh, they, they call it a revisionist Western. They call it Unforgiven a revision, revisionist Western. There's nothing revisionist about Unforgiven or um, Django Unchained. They're, they're, these are standard classic Westerns. Uh, but they call them revisionist because they deal with more adult, more mature themes. Uh, they're dealing with deeper uh, subject matter. And, but that's not new to Westerns. Uh, in the 50s, which for, for me was a, a prime era uh, for, the, for the Western genre, I mean, you had uh, Jimmy Stewart made a series of films with Anthony Mann that, that, that plumbed the depths of human psychology and aberrant human behavior. I mean, Jimmy Stewart in some of these films is, is near psychotic in his behavior. He's still the good guy, but he's, he's driven, obsessed. You know, these, like, these are Greek tragedies set in the West. And it certainly explored deeper themes. Uh, Delmer Davis made a, a, a couple of films in the Western genre, 310 to Yuma and Jubal, both with Glenn Ford, that um, you know, do the same thing. They explore the human psyche. Uh, 310 to Yuma in particular is, is a, an action Western, but it's also a bit of a psychological thriller. Um, and certainly, but, but certainly not revisionist, because what is a Western? It is a story of conflict that is resolved through violence. And that's as simple as I can get. That's why people love Westerns, because the form is simple. They understand it, and it's malleable. You can stretch it and do all kinds of things with it. The same can be said for uh, the the last films, the last um, five or six films made by Randolph Scott with his own production company, using the same writer and director, Bud uh, Bert, uh, Kennedy and Bud Bodeker, on all the six films. And these two explore... Uh, themes that were very mature, very adult. Uh, these stories are a bit dark. Uh, well, not a bit dark. They're quite a bit dark and noirish. And uh, they're worth checking out. The, the last films of, that, of Randolph Scott before he retired, uh, Ride Lonesome, The Tall T, uh, Buchanan Rides Alone, uh, and uh, uh, what is it? Yeah. Can't remember the last one. Uh, Comanche Station, which was, which was, is Clint Eastwood's favorite Western. Um, next question, Craig Jowles, do you have any stories that you feel are underrated and don't get the recognition they deserve? Not in an egocentric way, but just wish they had reached a wider audience. Um, yeah, Joker's Devil's Advocate is the one. I've spoken about this a bunch of times. I probably even answered this question before, but Joker's Devil's Devil's Advocate by by me and Graham Nolan. Uh, I really wish it had reached a broader audience. Uh, Graham and I worked very hard on this story. We we worked hard on everything we did, but this one was um, more intense. We actually met uh, in New York for a few days to hash out the plot line and everything else. Graham is very very much the co writer on this one, and I, I needed his assistance because it's it's a rather complex whodunit mystery. Uh, as well as what we felt would be a classic Joker story, and also answer the question, why doesn't Batman just kill Joker? Uh, so it's just, it, it, it sort of explores Joker's psyche as much as you can, because the Joker reinvents himself every day, but it also explores Batman's motivations and you know exactly where does his moral compass stand on, on a lot of issues like the death penalty and, uh, you know, abuses of uh, the law and the rule of law itself. And um, yeah, I wish more people had read it. I wish that DC had marketed it better. They kind of marketed it as, hey, the two guys that are doing detective comics every month have a really expensive hardcover volume they want you to buy. Um, I think some people thought that it would eventually be serialized in the detective and didn't buy it. Uh, It didn't help that DC really didn't push it very much, advertise it very much, and, and they didn't keep it in print. 
right? or included in collections, omnibuses about the Joker. And as much as uh, they exploit the Joker and Batman at DC, you think they would want to keep pumping this one out, even if it meant including it in a volume with other Joker stories. But they didn't, they don't, and what are you going to do about it? But uh, try and find it. They're rather expensive <laughs> when you do. Uh, but uh, check it out. I, it's uh, Graham and I are, are extraordinarily proud of this book. Jeff Padigo. Who killed Dudley Soames after you left DC? I thought he was an excellent Batman-esque villain with a great gimmick, and he had a fully realized backstory. So I was surprised when they killed him off. Was they writer Devin Grayson or editor Michael Wright, or the whole affair has just never smelled right? Thanks. Uh, yeah, that's one of those nobody-leave-this-room mysteries. Uh, Dudley Soames, also known as Torque, uh, former uh, chief police inspector at Bloodhaven who uh, gets his head turned around, literally, by uh, Blockbuster and somehow survives with his head on backwards. Um, he was kind of my, um, you know, uh, second to Blockbuster, the, the main nemesis for Nightwing. And of course, he blames Nightwing for his fate. He doesn't blame Block Blockbuster. And the other character being um, Tad Ryerstad, Nightwing. That's Nightwing with a hyphen. Uh, who uh, is, a, is a total psychopath obsessed with justice. And of course, justice is in the eye of the beholder, and, and in Tad's eye, it's anybody he doesn't like uh, has to be punished. And he has this twisted idea that he's going to be a superhero, this fantasy, and so he, he runs around in a hockey jersey and a mask, and uh, he's going to imitate his hero, Nightwing. And when the two of them met, it was, it was never pleasant. And... Uh, you know, he's, he's, a, he's to, to me, the, the, the perfect villain, the guy who thinks he's doing right, and, and he isn't. He's, he's a twisted jerk. Uh, he's not real bright. Uh, but he had a backstory as well, of obviously, child abuse, substance abuse, and everything else. Now, as to who killed him, uh, in my last issue of Nightwing, I had um, Tad Ryerstead and Dudley Soames enter a room, and there's gunshots, and, and I don't. I didn't resolve it. I left it completely open. I had no idea uh, what I was going to do next because I wasn't going to do anything next. I was handing the book over to Devin Grayson. I was not going to resolve the storyline. And when Michael Wright called me and said, well, who, who survives? I said, oh, I'm leaving up to Devin. Now, whether Devin decided that Dudley Soames must die uh, or Michael Wright told her, uh, that's who he wanted to talk about. It was editorially driven. I don't know. I don't know to this day. Um, I wouldn't envy anybody taking over to Dudley Soames character. So maybe Devin just chose the path of least resistance uh, because so she wouldn't have to mimic or imitate or somehow figure out what my voice for Dudley Soames was. Um, Tad Ryerstad, Tad Ryerstad, from my point of view, was a writer coming in cold. If I were to come in cold on these characters, I would think, well, Tad's the easier of the two to write. And actually had more story. I think Dudley Soames' story was kind of over at this point. But Tad Ryerstead was, you know, infinitely fascinating as, you know, this um, brutal moron who could enter the story at any, any time, you know, as an agent of uh, chaos. So uh, whoever picked it, I, I think they made the right choice. Uh, probably made the choice I would have made. I would have had a hard time killing Tad because I both loathe and, and like him at the same time. <laughs> so we'll never know unless I run into Devin or Michael Wright sometime and ask them. Uh, cool guy 9000. Uh, what do you think of Jonah Hex and his stories? Recently, I've tried reading his comics through trades and omnibuses, but DC has done a terrible job of collecting them, only releasing one omnibus every decade or so, with the first two being in black and white, and the third being a colored version of the first. Why do you think this is? Well, I really, um, I don't know. I, I can't tell you why DC reprints what they reprint and why they do it in the formats they do. I mean, there was a recent DC War collection. So I thought it was very odd because all of the awesome DC War comics there were and they reprinted some stuff that was actually pretty lame. And, you know, it was it was like latter-day pale imitations of the classic stuff 
of the 60s and 70s. But, you know, uh, I think mostly they have people doing these collections who are disinterested in the material. And, you know, I assume it's based on sales. But, you know, I, I know the volumes you're talking about. And if they did two showcase volumes of Jonah Hex, it means the first one sold. Uh, they don't do a second volume of something if the first one didn't sell. So there, there probably is an audience. I mean, there is an audience for Jonah Hex out there. Uh, but do they want to explore it? And that's always been the problem for Jonah Hex, is the disinterest that DC uh, has shown to the character. If you don't know who Jonah Hex is, he came about in the uh, early 70s. Uh, tough guy, Western character, scarred, mean, uh, vengeful, vindictive. Uh, just a nasty piece of work, a real anti-hero created to be an anti-hero and, uh, you know, ran for a long time in, you know, starting in Weird Western and uh, ran for a long time in his own comic, which um, was one of DC's top selling titles uh, in the 70s. Their superhero titles were bottom basement sales wise. No one was buying Superman, Batman, Green Lantern and the rest. Uh, their biggest sellers were their, you know, quote unquote horror comics, which really weren't that horrible. Uh, they were more mystery comics, but they, they those sold well. Supernatural comics, I should say. <clears throat> and their war comics, they had, they had five war titles all through the 70s, uh, whereas Batman and Superman only had two each. Uh, and Jonah Hex. Uh, Jonah Hex sold very, very well. He sold, you know, sometimes, some months he was their number one title. So there was an enormous audience for these Western stories. And um, I liked them. I liked them. Michael J. Fleischer writes most of the run. Uh, I only lost interest as a reader when Hex gets married. Always a mistake. And they kind of have him settle down. Uh, I didn't, you know, I kind of lost interest in the book at that point. But, you know, the artwork is terrific. Tony DiZaniga, Louis Dominguez, uh, Jose Garcia Lopez. <clears throat> just does, fan they, they're doing fantastic work on this stuff. And a lot of people say, well, Jonah Hex was inspired by the spaghetti westerns. And maybe in part that's true, but I really think, <clears throat> and and um, I really think they were more inspired by a series of very, very mean, very, very brutal, very, very cynical and, and uh, you know, violent westerns that came out produced by American companies in in the early 70s. Uh, movies like The Hunting Party, uh, Valdez is Coming, uh, Chato's Land, L Lawman, and others. And these were like standard Western stories, but with um, a really nasty uh, turn. I mean, Hunting Party was rated R. The rest of these were related were rated PG, but remember they were 1970s PG, which be an instant R today. <laughs> but they were very violent, very bloody, with with conflicted characters and lots of nasty goings on. And I really think that this is where Hex comes from. And uh, another proof of Hex's uh, popularity was is that he was collected into digest size comics on three occasions. So that's another testimony that he was a a, a well uh, well read, very popular. Uh, character amongst readers that they would collect his stories into these digest volumes, which at the time were uh, one of the few profitable areas of publication DC was doing. And, uh, I, and, and it, it, you can't talk about Hex without talking about uh, the Jonah Hex uh, dollar spectacular. Uh, DC was doing these dollar comics with no ads uh, at the time, trying to uh, find, you know, fight for their place on the newsstand against like Time Magazine and Newsweek. <laughs> with the dollar comic. Uh, newsstand owners at the time were complaining that comics were cheap and they were taking up too much space for the return. So DC uh, in particular started doing more expensive dollar editions. And uh, this one's remarkable. It's, it's 100 pages of all new Western stories featuring DC Western characters. But the most amazing part of it is, is the lead Jonah Hex story drawn by Russ Heath, written by Michael J. Fleischer, in, and it is the last Jonah Hex story because Hex dies in this story. And uh, it's just a terrific. I mean, it is the perfect, perfect ending to the Jonah Hex saga. And if you've never read it, you need to seek it out. I have no idea what these things go for on eBay. 
but you should be able to find a reader's copy for a decent amount of money because I think this thing's this thing sold well, so it, it it had a pretty high print run. Johnny McCloskey, you mentioned that you will bind the comics you're working you've worked on. If you don't mind me asking, what company do you use to do the binding? My personal favorite binder is closed down. I'm looking for a new company. Well, I'm sort of in the same boat as you. Uh, for years, I was getting my stuff bound by a company in Reading, Pennsylvania. Uh, but the last time I gave them stuff to bind, they did a really crappy job. I don't know if they were under new management or they just hired a bunch of seriously untalented uh, binders because uh, they actually bound uh, three volumes with the issues all in the wrong order. Uh, you know, whereas, you know, the, the, when you send stuff to the bindery, there's forms to fill out. So they know they understand exactly what you want. So there's zero mistakes made. So I just stopped using that bindery because they suck. Uh, so if you hear or anybody watching this hears about a uh, place that does great work binding comics, I'd love to hear because I've got maybe a, a you know, five-year backlog of comics sitting around in stacks um, waiting to be bound. And the reason why I bind them uh, at first was so I had ready reference. Uh, also, so that I know I have at least one copy of every one of every comic I've written. Uh, and I can assure that by having them bound and up on a shelf. Um, you know, it's not, they can't be broken up. Because when you get comps and stuff, you start giving them away to people as gifts. Um, and you lose track. And then one day you find out, you, you know, you you don't have issue four of Captain Potato Salad. And now you got to go on eBay and buy your own comic book. So, <laughs> um so that's the original reason for binding. And, and where I got the idea of binding was I read an interview with John Severin uh, about his EC, uh, his work at EC. And he mentioned the fact that he had all of his comics bound. That as, um, as a stack formed, he sent it off to the bindery. And I thought, whoa, what a cool idea. If I ever become a comic book writer, that's what I'm going to do. And that's what I did. So yeah, if you hear of a good bindery, anybody, anybody, <laughs> Bueller, let me know. Okay, Christopher Hernandez. I was listening to a Tim Truman interview, and he mentioned Four Winds Publishing while he was working for Eclipse. Seemed like a power team. Team up with yourself and him doing comics. He said you sold your shares and left after a year or two. Was it just personal business move or just overworked? He had no hard feelings or real words about you. Tim seems like a chill, understanding guy. Yeah, Four Winds kind of, uh, why is that like that? Well, I'm going to skip to the next picture. I had a picture of all of us in Chicago and I didn't blow it up. So and I'm doing these things live, baby. These things are done off the cuff. There's no rehearsal. There's no setup. Anyway, Four Winds Publishing grew out of a, you know, like a gang of us that began hanging out together because uh, we shared interests and everything else. And Tim was kind of the center of the group. And, uh, you know, um, you know, pencilers, inkers, colorists, letterers, you know, just guys doing comics. And we were all basically starting our careers at roughly the same time. Uh, a number of them were Kubert School graduates where, um, or Kubert School attendees. I don't, I don't know many Kubert School graduates. <laughs> so, uh, and, and Tim went, went to the Kubert School, did not graduate. Uh, so, um, you know, he and I were simpatico. We, we had a lot of things in common. We had a lot of things that we didn't have in common. But um, we, we, we liked comics and we liked a lot of the same comics. So uh, it was his idea to form this Four Winds imprint at Eclipse that eventually became uh, a full-fledged publisher with some investment from me and him. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we, we figured out the details and did all the solicitations. Back in those days, it involved a lot of Xeroxing, a lot of Xeroxing, because in those days there were a number of distributors. There wasn't just Diamond. And if you sent them bundles of um, of you know, ad stuff, promo stuff, uh, they would include it with their catalog. They just throw it in um, with the catalog so retailers could see it and possibly order your stuff. So uh, we did a lot of that. I always kind of suspected that we were Xeroxing this material and bundling it off and it was never, no retailer ever saw it because it wasn't in the distributor's interest to throw it in the packets. Uh, and how would we know if they just tossed it in the dumpster? But, um, Sales were okay. I think we broke even or made a little bit of profit on each book. 
And uh, the, the whole idea was to, uh, the, well, for me anyway, I wasn't interested in the business end uh, any more than Tim was. <laughs> so I was more interested in this as a creative outlet. Um, one of the reasons I left is because it really wasn't a creative outlet for me. Uh, most of the um, new work that we did was was Tim, Tim writing and drawing. Uh, we did some reprint stuff because I had an association with um, a studio, a publisher in Argentina, and a lot of friends amongst Argentine artists. And so we did a couple of collections of Alcatena's work, a collection of Juan Zanotto, and then we published two volumes of Atu, a, uh, a sort of sci-fi fantasy adventure story by uh, the great Sam Glansman. But, you know, the, the wheels kind of came off where you'll notice here that there's nothing that I wrote uh, and had drawn. And I kept proposing things and getting shot down by my partner. <laughs> and that's when I realized I'm, I'm not going anywhere here. I mean, we're supposed to be equal partners. We're supposed to be equals. I don't think Tim saw us that way. Uh, I think he saw me as the guy who would end up doing all the paperwork while he, you know, uh, you know, he went on doing his own comics, uh, his own creations. <clears throat> so basically I was partnered with my own gatekeeper and uh, I thought, well, I'm, I'm not getting anywhere here. I, I can go off on my own with the projects that I want to do at Four Winds because I can interest other publishers in these and actually get them to see the light of day. And so, uh, you know, we parted company. You know, I, uh, I uh, divested myself and left him with the Xerox machine <laughs> and uh, took off for greener pastures. So that's, that's the story of Four Winds. And lots of our friends and stuff were so disappointed because they thought we were like the, we were like the next Beatles of comics or something. Like we were going to, you know, move the earth and, and change everything. I, I don't think that was going to happen. I, I didn't care about that. I didn't want to be a big player in the comic book business. And I don't think that Tim wanted that either. I think we, we both just wanted a creative outlet uh, for stuff without having to pitch. We wanted to do what we wanted to do. Uh, and it ended because I wasn't getting to do what I wanted to do. Simple, simple as that. Um, Hey, if you want to get a hold of me, you can email me at brunobookstore at gmail.com. Questions, suggestions, pictures of your doggies and kitties, uh, pictures of shelves full of your own bound books. I don't care. Uh, and the, uh, this is the most direct way to reach me. I, I never miss a question here. Um, now you can ask questions below this video. You can ask me questions on Facebook or Twitter, but chances are I might miss them. I might miss them, but I'm not going to miss it if you send it here. And hey, while I got you, you might want to check out Midnight's War. It is a vampire epic. Uh, it's a Kickstarter. It's by me and Vox Day. It is presents an alternate universe where vampires are the ruling class. They are not only the apex predator on the planet, they're running things. You know, they're they're the the politicians and businessmen and the rest of us. The rest of us are just cattle uh, and, you know, serfs to these uh, undead ruling class. And my portion of this is the creation of, of Kyle Buckner, a former soldier who becomes a cop, uh, a, a human cop who is kind of the day watch for the vampires. Uh, and he gets involved in all kinds of adventures and mysteries. It's a police thriller set in a world ruled by vampires and will have a spinoff. I've already written two issues of Midnight's War Night Streets, which will be, uh, which will be out following uh, the printing of this graphic novel. People have been asking for a while when is Arctoons going to start printing some of the material that show up on the Arctoons uh, webcomic site. And this is the first of many. Now, the project I'm working on is a Rambo in uh, First Kill. And it's um, a comic done by Splato Comics, written by me and Sylvester Stallone, or Sylvester Stallone and me, properly. And has some incredible artwork by a fantastic team of art artists, including Butch Geist, Matt Barr, uh, Aaron Affleck. And it's, uh, it's in the coloring stages right now. And it is available. Let's go. Let's get this up here. 
it it is available on Indiegogo um, as an in-demand. Uh, we've already reached our goal, but if you want a copy of this uh, graphic novel, which will be in full color, it's with the colorist now, probably in the final stages of coloring, off to the printers, should be in the hands of supporters uh, early in 23. And uh, it's cool stuff. It's Rambo's first tour in Vietnam, and it is a stand-up, uh, gutsy uh, war story. Uh, a lot of the incidents in this story are based on events described to me by vets who served in Vietnam, uh, who told me these stories firsthand, and I incorporated some of the elements of their stories into this. So if you ever wanted to know how uh, John Rambo became the man he he appeared to be in the movies, uh, this is your opportunity in comic form. So check that out at Indiegogo. And that's it for me this week. I want to thank you for watching, listening, liking, subscribing, spreading the word, and uh, supporting any of these projects. Um, and I really appreciate it. So look for the links below to all the stuff I talked about here. And I'll see all of you down the road.